Hello and welcome to episode 14 of Playground here on the Play by Jelly Note Discord server. My name is JC the Beard and I am the Brass Section Leader and I'm joined by my fabulous co-host Dana who is the Strings Section Leader. Dana, how are you doing today? I'm doing awesome! I'm super excited for today's topic. I think that it's going to be great and it really ties into a special event that we're doing right now so I think that that is extra fun. Yeah, I absolutely love that we're getting into fall to uh, just get a little bit off topic real quick because there's all sorts of fun changes in the uh, weather and the landscape with the leaves changing color and with play as well because we got some exciting new stuff to show you. But first, let's go ahead and get into today's topic, which by popular demand is more music theory. We've got scales, keys, and modes we're going to discuss today, and we're going to do a brief overview of the different topics and go into a little bit more detail and then maybe a little bit about which different instruments prefer different keys and different styles of writing as well if we have time. But but I'm going to go ahead and get started by sharing a finale window with you that I have some different scale things prepared with. So give me one moment to pull that up and we'll go ahead and start broadcasting that. All right. So you should now be able to see my finale window. That is scales demonstration. I know I am a fantastic musical uh, title generator. You'll have to uh, thank me later for that. It's a skill. <laughs> it's a skill that I do not have, but fortunately I can, <laughs> I can put the, uh, the notes in finale all the same. So just to uh, kind of reiterate a little bit, when we last talked about music theory, we talked about triads, right? So we discussed a little bit about how scales work with regard to things like placement within a triad where you have the first, the third, and the fifth, and then there's other triads as well, which we'll get to when we get to seventh chords and all the other fun stuff. But to make a triad, you have to have a knowledge of how the scale works. And what we're going to do today is explore a little bit more about that. Remember, we did show the major scale. Uh, pardon me, I'm looking here at the spot on the screen, so I'm not going to be looking directly eye contact with you guys here. But we do have this right here. We have this major scale starting in the key of C because C is a really easy key for everyone to understand. We've got C, D, E, F, G, A, B natural, and then C again. And then right back down, we go down to this first C note. So we all know the major scale, and most of us are familiar with the natural minor scale, which starts in the same key well, the same written key on the A below this C right here. And then you go A, B natural, C, D, E, F, G, A again, and then right back down. And we did touch on the harmonic minor and the melodic minor last week, or it wasn't last week, but the last time we discussed this, we did not talk about pentatonic scale. We'll get there in a second. But one thing I wanted to make sure that we uh, reiterated here before we go too far is that all of these are in the same written key. You just move the starting point of where the natural minor and the natural major scale start. And that's gonna tie into modes, which Dana's gonna get into a little later. But let's go ahead and take a listen real quick to how all of these sound in sequence, and then we're gonna talk about what makes them different. So let's go ahead and get this fired up here. There's your major scale. That's natural minor. That's harmonic minor. And that's melodic minor. No, don't play that one yet. So what, you, what you'll notice is that all of these minor scales all start on the A, which is the sixth scale degree of the uh, same key. So they all start the same, but the uh, harmonic minor scale you'll see here has the seventh scale degree raised. And then the melodic minor does the same thing on the way up and also adds the sixth scale degree raised. But on the way down, it's the natural minor scale, which is all sorts of fun and uh, different from what you might expect. But that's your three major, uh, your three major minor scales, your three minor scales that you're going to most uh, commonly we're encounter. Horrible. Yeah, we are absolutely, we're having a great time here. But now this pentatonic <laughs> scale, and if... If you've played stuff like uh, different genres from, say, classical music or what have you, you're probably familiar with this. But if you're not, the pentatonic scale is, as the Latin root word might imply, consisting of five notes. So what you do to make a pentatonic scale, which we'll go ahead and play real quick. is you take away the second scale degree and you take away the sixth scale degree. So you have one, three, four, 
five, seven, and then eight, which is the one again. So that creates a, uh, a different kind of sound aesthetic, if you will. I don't know what the term would be for that, but I just like the uh, usage of that vibe. word there. Vibe. Feel. Vibe is a good one. That's why that's why we have multiple people hosting these, because sometimes you can come <laughs> up with stuff that I can't I can't figure out how to uh, how to explain here. And vice versa. Right. So, uh, yeah, so there's there's different moods and different feels right to each of these between the major, the three different minor ones and then the pentatonic scale. So when you're writing music, you can take advantage of the different emotions and the feelings that these can conjure up in people. And you can use that to kind of make your music more uh, relatable and emote more effectively to the audience which I think is fun. There's a whole lot of stuff about composition and arrangement that we can cover at another time or in one of our composition classes, hint, hint, that we have every uh, every first Friday of every month on the uh, Play Discord. They're all sorts of fun and you should join them. But uh, Dana, I wanted to ask if you had any additional thoughts on the basics of the scales here before we move on to talk I about different things. That First off, I think that this is awesome and you did a great job. Um, I would not have thought as a hardcore classical musician, I would not have thought to include pentatonic, even though I learned it in school. So I appreciate you including that because I would not have come up with that myself. Um, I think that's something worth mentioning as well is why the harmonic and melodic minor scales are the way that they are, right? Mm -hmm. So because there is a reason why we raise these notes. It's not, it's not just because we feel like making things harder for the rest of the planet. Um, <laughs> because it can be an inconvenience. <laughs> but in, in the case of both harmonic minor and melodic minor, I personally am more familiar with melodic minor because that is what I practice, that is what I play frequently. Um, I don't play harmonic minor that terribly often, um, so I'm not quite as well versed in that one, I suppose. But um, it's the same concept in both of these scales when you are raising either the seventh or in the case of melodic minor the sixth and the seventh we're doing that because our ear wants to lead us up to that top note it wants to lead us up to that eight or one again they're 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 the same thing right and so that is why we are raising those scale degrees is because that is what our ear wants to hear it wants to push up to those notes at least in um in western music where these scales are most apparent it's there are thousands and thousands of scales worldwide and we would be here for the next uh several 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 hours if we were to get into all of the scales of the world that would be um an incredibly comprehensive thing for us to do. So I think that it's also worth noting that these scales are conventional in Western music, but that does not mean that they are the be all end all. This is the way that it is, blah, blah, blah. These are just the ones that we come across frequently in Western music. And that is a frequent convention in Western music where our ear wants to lead up to that tonic. And so that is why we are raising those tones. Now, it because our ear wants to lead up to the tonic and not vice versa, that is why we don't raise those notes on the descending scale of melodic minor. That is why those notes go back down to natural instead of from their, you know, from their raised form earlier, is because we are leading down from the tonic. So we don't have the need to hear those notes reaching upwards toward the towards the tonic. Um, in harmonic minor, that is not the case. I am not explicitly sure why again because i don't encounter this one uh qu very frequently in my personal practice and stuff like that but that one we do not lower it on the way down it is just the way that it is jc or anyone in chat here as well do any of you know why we don't lower the seventh on the way down in harmonic minor because i don't jacob might yeah do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself feel free to say something please well, I, as a uh, mostly low instruments player, know quite a bit about the harmonic scale. The entire nice. purpose of the existence of a uh, harmonic uh, scale is, as its name implies, to create harmonies. The chords are for a minor song, or a song in a minor key, uh, are... Uh, all made of uh, this harmonic scale, not necessarily the natural minor scale. Uh, in major, it that is, however, the case. In minor, not so much. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That is what I thought. That is what I recalled, but I didn't remember it strongly enough to make a definitive clarifying statement. So I appreciate you saying that. So you've heard it here first. The reason that we don't lower it in harmonic minor is because it is used harmonically and not mel melodically. Melodic, as the name implies, is more used for melodies and stuff like that, and so that is why we are more concerned with how the melody of the scale sounds to our ears. That's how that works. Anyways, JC, back to you. <laughs> yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up with the, uh, the usage of the harmonic minor scale for harmonies, because that kind of leads me to something else I wanted to discuss about melodic minor. So if you're still looking here at the finale window, uh, again, you have the 6th and the 7th scale degrees are raised, and then on the way down, they're not. So the way that I like to think about this is you're still in a minor scale, right? So if you have something like underneath a melodic line, chances are the harmonies and the bass line of something like that are not going to be using the raised 6th and the raised 7th, even though, yes, sometimes the raised 7th will show up, as Jacob did point out. But you have, say, a melodic line going above chord changes is going to sometimes depart from the conventions of whatever chord structure or changes, if you're a jazz musician, are going to be using. So I, that's what I like to have about the... Uh, the uh, the melodic minor that changes on the way up and then goes back to convention on the way down because it's kind of like a, a whole thing of hey look at me look at me I'm different and then on the way back down you're like okay well I guess I'll I'll, ju I'll just go away and let somebody else figure something out I don't know I, I have I have this kind of weird inner dialogue about a uh, personifying music things sometimes but it's <laughs> it's fun again it's it's not something you're going to encounter a ton a ton especially if you're a wind band musician like myself. Most of the stuff you're going to play in wind band is going to be major or it's going to be natural minor or you're going to get a couple different times where you're going to see something else. I don't think I've ever played pentatonic in a wind band piece, and that's just a function of the genre and the uh, instrumentation, I suppose. All sorts of other more popular music is going to have that all over the place. Different places around the world are going to have different interpretations, as we've mentioned before. And there's all sorts of combinations that we literally just don't have time to get into. But there, there's a wonderful gamut of music around the world that uses different things in different ways. And I hope we have the chance to talk about more of this someday. But we are going to have to move on in the interest of time. So hopefully that's some helpful information about scales for you guys. Let's go ahead and move on to keys before we move to talk on uh, modes real quick. I also have have a demonstration pulled up from the wonderful website of Wikipedia because they had a large scalable vector graphic of the circle of fifths. So that's what we're going to uh, going to be showing right now. So let me just put that screen up as well. So you see before you the circle of fifths. If you click on the live stream, will give you a couple of seconds to get in there. But the reason I chose this to demonstrate relationships between keys is because it does a really good job of talking about relative majors and minors, and then also how different progressions change as you go around. So if everyone's in there, let's just start at the top. You have C major, which is what we uh, discussed previously in the scales demonstration, and it's natural minor, which is going to be A minor in lowercase because it's minor. And then what we do in the circle of fifths, again, if you were in wind band or maybe orchestras do this as well, but in band, we always, every single day when we did warm ups, is we played scales around the circle of fifths. So again, that's what this is. You have, as you go around clockwise, you add a sharp. So you go from C major to G major because the first key with a sharp sign is G major with the one sharp, and that's the F sharp because it's the leading tone. Remember how we discussed in the melodic minor and the harmonic minor, you have those that are raised because the ear is training to go back up to that tonic note. So you have the leading tone raised in G major, and then that's natural minor, E minor, is also a fifth past the A minor. You see where this is going, that's why it's called the circle of fifths. You could also do circle of fourths, but that's not as common. Uh, Dana, is that something that the strings players of the world are really nope. familiar with? Really? That's fascinating. I, I would have thought I mean, you guys do would have done that. Fourths. We do the fifths. We, okay. don't, we don't use the fourths. <laughs> okay. Now, is that because uh, violin is, uh, the strings are tuned to fifths on violins, right? Yeah, so that that's probably why it is. I'm not sure um, specifically why. I'm not sure specifically why we do that. Probably, you know, blah, 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 our ears and the fifths and the way that the scales all... Um, I know the word, the way that they all resolve. Yes. Ha, that was um, 
elusive for a moment. Mm-hmm. Yes, because of the way that they all resolve, blah, blah, blah. I think that that's why we do it the way that we do. All right. Well, that's good. That's good to know, because this uh, this is something that's been absolutely drilled into my brain until I want to puke. Right. Because, well, that that's what that's what band does is you, you practice perfect and then you play perfect. Right. So, again, we'll, we'll go with, we'll any keep, <laughs> with any luck. Right. Perfect practice makes perfect. Practice makes permanent. Just keep that in mind, kids. But uh, let, let's keep going around the circle of fists. We go from G. We add a sharp and we get to D major. And of course, in D major, the leading tone has to be that major seventh, that seventh interval. So we have the C becomes sharp. And then, all right, I guess I'll just cut to the chase here because I was going to kind of tell this at the end. But if you have a key that you want to you want to tell like what key signature it is, all you have to do is go to the leading tone of that key, and that's going to be the most recent sharp, if that makes any sense. So like I said, the D, the most recent sharp in there from the uh, right side is going to be the C sharp. The G is the F sharp. And if you look at the A, you have, what's that? That's a, oh, that's not a B sharp. I'm in bass clef mode. Good God. That's a G sharp. That's a G sharp, which is the leading tone in A major. I'm sorry. I'm a euphonium player. I default to bass clef and these are trebles. But as, as we go Dang. along, <laughs> as we go along, you'll see that all of these sharp keys, the most, the rightmost sharp is the leading tone of that key. So if you ever need to figure out, oh, I don't know what key this is. Like, look, look at this mess. You got six sharps here on the F sharp major. It's like, you look at that. Oh, that's panic mode. If I'm a brass player, I hate that. I hate every single thing about that. And I don't want it to exist. But if I have to play it anyway, then I can just look at the rightmost sharp and look, hey, that's an E sharp. What's E sharp? It's an F. What's the leading tone of F? Hey, F sharp. There you go. So that's how you determine that's F sharp. I'd much rather look at its little brother over here, G flat, because it's a flat key and I'm a brass player. But yeah, so you, you can see like right here down at the bottom, things get a little muddy because there's a lot of sharps, lots of flats. And then some people get mad if it's not their favorite flavor. So they want something else. And that's how you get all this stuff. But then we go around to the flat side and you can see right here, of course, G flat has these six flats. The rightmost flat is actually the C flat. And you might ask yourself, wait, that's not the leading tone. It's not the leading tone, but it is a fifth below G flat. So you come back to this whole circle of fifths idea with your flat keys. You can just say, okay, well, the uh, rightmost flat in the key signature is going to be a fifth below the actual key. And that's true for all of these. You have the G flat, it's the C flat, like I said before, the D flat is this G flat and then so on and so forth. And then you get back down to F and the only flat in this F key signature is B flat, which is what it's a fifth below F. So that's a fun way to remember that if you weren't familiar with that. And then of course, all of the relative minors are the same as well. As you go around uh, this C sharp major, just burn it with fire. It shouldn't exist. Yep. I, yep. <laughs> I, I just, but again, we that's, disagree that, on our that's the way it has flats, to go. But we agree on that. I I just I absolutely hate everything about seven sharps and not seven flats. Exist. I like flats. Yeah, not great. Not I don't great like seven. Direction. I do not like seven flats. I'm going to be most comfortable as a brass player between F, B flat, E flat, or A flat. D flat's fine, and then you get into the sharp keys, and it's just like mm, yeah, maybe, maybe I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, so I guess I could take a, a very quick aside to plug the brass instrument's favorite keys since I kind of just mentioned it. But uh, if again, if you're writing music or arranging or teaching or looking for something to play or whatever, and you might not be super experienced on an instrument, if you're a brass player, you're probably going to want to stick to something that's in this corner of the, uh, I guess, the nine o'clock to noon section of this uh, this little uh, chart here. Pretend this is a clock because in a brass instrument in the key of B flat, right? Which is what euphonium is, even though it's it's concert pitch bass clef, which a lot of people will notate as euphonium and bass clef C, which is right, it's concert pitch, but the instrument's pitched in B flat, right? So B flat is gonna kind of be your home key where you have all of your open notes are going to be some variant of the B flat or the F or the D or whatever. And it's gonna be very, very easy for you to play in B flat. That's where most of the comfortable notes on the instrument lie. If you're a horn player, it's an F. If you're you're playing on the F side of the horn. If you have a double horn, then that's going to be most comfortable for you. If you have the B flat side, B flat's going to be good. Uh, e flat brass instruments are not very common where I live, but I do know that they exist. You have different variants of alto tenor horns. You have uh, 
E flat French horns even exist in some spots, uh, alto trombone, everything, your E flat, that's going to be kind of your home key, and then so on and so forth. And there's others that are not really super relevant to this discussion, but that's brass instruments, most favorable keys. And I know string players have completely different opinions on that. So I will let Dana talk about that. Flats for violins are terrible. I see floor say in the chat. Okay. Well, that's, that's the way the cookie crumbles, right? Not everyone's going to be happy with the same stuff. And I think that's why a lot of orchestral music is written in sharp keys or C major or a minor or what have you. But uh, Dana, how about the string players? We like to live in 12 to three o'clock that is where we belong so just as jc was saying um we are most the thing wow we are most comfortable in that zone because that is kind of where most of our um default fingerings lie for string instruments are pretty comfortably around uh g d and a depending on what strings you're on for beginners we usually start in a major on the strings a and e because there are you know very few alterations from our default fingering not from the default key of c major but from our actual fingering that we use with the violin so kind of a different um different system that we're going off of here and for this, as yep going in the same vein <laughs> the same thing is true of d major on the d string and the a string um and g major is also quite comfortable at you know c major perfectly fine perfectly fine but we don't start beginners in c major most of the time um we usually start yeah we usually start in a major and then kind of start going backwards that's where we're most comfortable that is what our instruments like um and we have a few things in the chat here uh, specifically, Tim's eight says that he has a lot to say about this. I'm sure you do. Feel free to um, unmute and give us your give us your thoughts on that, if you so desire. Well, I would just like to say that in absolute general, uh, wind instruments prefer flats, and string instruments prefer uh, sharps. That's for the very fundamental reason that when adding a finger on a wind instrument, you generally lower the note. And when adding a finger on a string instrument, you generally make the note higher. Helpful so that's the basic principle. That's the most basic understanding I have from my experience with a few different instruments. Just a few. Of uh, how uh, these different keys are favorable to a different instrument. If an instrument is a, as I was introduced to it, a solo instrument, meaning it has a giant range of notes and the can usually play many notes at the same time. These are the instruments as uh, a piano, uh, a harp, an organ, an accordion. These usually don't uh, have a preference like that uh, built into the instrument. However, they tend to favor uh the keys that they were raised in which uh which may very well vary on the teacher okay that's a good well point said. mostly if the teacher does a lot with string players then the then the student will very much prefer sharps if the teacher uh likes to live with wind players uh, then their students will prefer flats a lot so that's that's about it yes <laughs> i'm glad that's you awesome. brought that that's up. hilarious <laughs> yeah so uh, i yeah, was uh... i think that we greatly appreciate your insight on this i personally ha have a hard time remembering why wind and brass players prefer flats so that is a helpful way of remembering it and i appreciate you putting it so uh so clearly i think that that illuminated it for me in a way that i wasn't thinking of it before. So I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. I just wanted to, uh, to touch base on a couple other things before we move on to modes, which is Dana's area of expertise here today. Um, the, the thing that you mentioned about adding fingers, adding fingers depressed, I guess would be, I don't, I don't know what the eloquent way of saying it is, but when you, when you descend on a brass instrument, you're adding fingers and that makes sense that you would want to think in the, the flat terminology there. I always just thought it was because that was how the, uh, the instruments were pitched and that would be more advantageous to that. But then I think about woodwinds right. as well. Right. Yeah. And woodwinds like, you know, you have, you have, well, soprano clarinet, there's a lot of different clarinets, soprano clarinets and B flat. You have alto clarinet is, is alto clarinet an F or are they an E flat? I can't remember. 
Juan, if, you, if you're watching this, don't get mad at me. I'm sorry, alto clarinet's not a very common instrument. But so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you have E-flat clarinet, which is really common in old military band stuff like Holst or uh, some of the... Uh, some of the Granger stuff has E flat clarinet in it as well. So I was I was just always thinking because that's the the keys the instruments were made in. So oh well, why not just have that be kind of the home keys for the stuff? But that makes a whole lot of sense, and I'm really glad you brought that up. Nice. I would guess that they probably relate to each other as well. The key that it's tuned in, and the fact that you mm -hmm. by depressing keys are going down. You know, blah blah blah. Right. Totally interrelates. I betcha. But yeah, very helpful. Very helpful. Yeah, and that's also why the the B natural is the worst key signature for a brass player to play because the fundamental pitch of most of the brass instruments is B flat. So if you're playing a B natural on a trumpet or a three valve euphonium or whatever, and you're playing the low one, you have to put all three fingers down. That's a, that doesn't sound good. You're, you're pushing through almost like the entire instrument's worth of tubing again to make notes. And it's just, mm, it's a bad time. Please do not write for brass in B major. If you're an arranger or a composer, just please, as a favor to me, don't do it. But I think, I think, <laughs> I think it's about time we go ahead and move on to modes. What do you think? Yeah. So we've already talked about a variety of different scales. And modes are like, they're a different version, slightly different version and different way of thinking about scales. So in this demonstration that I sent over to JC, I'm using the C major scale as an example, no sharps, no flats, it makes sense. Um, but you could do this and you know, it is used in every key. Here we go, let's go ahead mm -hmm. and pull this up. So I wanna do some talking about it and then I don't know why it formatted like that. Because it's, it's music XML. Then we go ahead and do it's some listening. I don't know why that last line is so long. I was hoping that it would export that's differently. Uh, Locrian is actually Latin for long boy, which is <laughs> why that's long. Anyway, let's... Uh... It's meant to be. <laughs> so... We have fun here. <laughs> okay. There are seven modes. Um, as you can see here, I've labeled each one of them. And going in order, they are Ioni... Yep, great start. <laughs> Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, and Locrian. Locrian, Locrian, I'm not sure. Tomato, tomato. Um, fun f <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fun fact about me is that I was out sick both times when my theory classes learned about modes in high school and college. That's so rough. So that was great. <laughs> and so the... I fully understand them, I fully comprehend them, but before every exam, I would have to re-memorize and cram study to remember which one was which, because there are a lot of them, as you could see. So, the basic concept of modes, we're going to start with our Ionian right here, and what I did is the bottom note in treble clef and um, all of the notes in bass clef, that is the basic scale. Those chords, we don't need to worry too much about those right now. I only put those there so that we can really, really hear the different, uh, forgive me, flavors of each scale. So I like that. let's go ahead and we'll get into it more. So we're going to take this first Ionian mode, which is actually our basic major scale. Major and Ionian are exactly the same thing. You just won't hear it referred to as Ionian terribly frequently, chances are. So. Ionian starts off on scale degree one. Ionian in the key of C major starts on C. Dorian starts on the second degree of the scale of C major, but it maintains the same accidentals as the C major key. So instead of our, you know, our typical one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, C E D E F G what C D E F G A B C I think I got that right. <laughs> hmm. Um it instead is going to go I'm going to really have to focus on this one. Um in Dorian it's going to go D E F G A B C D. Kind of funky. Phrygian in the same exact way is built off of the third scale degree. So third scale degree in C major is E. Same exact concept, we're going E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E. Lydian is based off of the fourth scale degree, so that's, what are we on? C, D, E, F. <laughs> Hopefully I'm keeping track of all of these. If I'm flubbing a letter here and there, uh, please, please don't fault me too terribly. <laughs> so Lydian is built off of the fourth scale degree, which in the key of C major, I just had it, C, D, E, F, F. is F. Mm -hmm. Mixolydian based off of the fifth 
Aeolian, based off of the sixth, which might sound familiar, and Locrian is based off of the seventh. Now, as we said, Aeolian is based off of the sixth, and that is actually going to give us a natural minor scale. So in this case, we know that the keys of C major and A minor, or, you know, we might not know that, but C major and A minor share a key signature, right? Every single major has a relative minor key that shares the same key signature. And so in this case, because C and A share the same key signature, um, this is how we get that natural minor scale, that Aeolian, because it's using all of the same uh, all of the same notes as C major, but they are clearly arranged differently. Now these are a little funky. These can sound a little bit unusual. All of them are used in their you know in their respective different genres and styles of music, and I certainly don't have a comprehensive knowledge of that. Um, what I do know, what I do specifically remember, because this is something that I dabble in personally, is that the Mixolydian scale right there is used very frequently in Celtic music, like Scottish music. That is one, I say Scottish music because that's one that I personally pr play frequently, um, but that is one that you're going to hear a lot in, yeah, Scottish music, like I just said. But And all of these kind of have their respective uses, their respective this and that and the other thing but they sound pretty different than you would necessarily expect. So let's go ahead and JC, if you don't mind, let's hear just the Ionian scale. Let's start there with our super basic major C major scale. Okay. Sounds like a C major scale, mm -hmm. right? That sounds like something that we are familiar with. Now, Dorian, the second one here, as we discussed, it is built off of the second scale degree in C major. So it's built off of D. Why don't we go ahead and hear that one? It's going to sound a little bit unusual because in a scale that starts on D, for example, let's take D major as one that our Western ears are quite familiar with. The key of D major has an F sharp and a C sharp, so you would expect to hear that, but we don't because this is a Dorian scale based off of C major with no sharps or flats. So that is what makes this kind of unusual. Let's go ahead and hear that Dorian scale now. It sounds, it sounds different, maybe a little bit unfinished, perhaps. And that is the case for a lot of the rest of these. They are pretty unusual. They sound maybe a little, depending on the person, unfinished. Maybe perhaps they are unsettling to you because they're just different. These are not scales that we typically use or hear in our Western music. Lots and lots of other people use them, but in the conventional things that your average person is hearing from day to day, they are hearing Ionian and Aeolian. So that is why the rest of these are going to sound likely pretty different to our ears. Let's go ahead and let's just start on Phrygian and hear all of the rest of them. And you'll notice how each one kind of has its own distinct feel, like we were saying earlier, its own distinct vibe, or again, forgive me, but a uh, flavor is <laughs> one that comes to mind. I love the use of the word flavor, just so, for the record. I know. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> so let's go ahead and yeah, we'll just go forward from Phrygian. We'll start there and we'll hear all of the rest of them. All right. And then a measure of rest. Pause. Yes. <laughs> the cursor lagged, so we're going to start over here. Sure. our natural minor scale, like we were saying before, our natural un unaltered minor scale, excuse me. That last one is funky. <laughs> I know. So 
As you can see, all of them have a very distinct sound and a very distinct feel. And something that, again, all these playground episodes, we can only cover so much in a certain amount of time. So this is absolutely something that could be much, much further researched and look, looked into, pardon me, um, where you can find out what types of music use all of these different scales. Again, like I was saying, I personally know that Mixolydian is used pretty frequently in Celtic music, um, and all of these other ones, they absolutely have their own uses. Some of them are much more common than others, I do believe. This is an information that I have at the front of my head because this is mainly designed to be, you know, exclusively a theory lesson. So we didn't go um, overly heavily into the application of all of these. But these are absolutely things that you can look up on your own. Um, these are just the ones, you know, Aeolian and Ionian. These are the ones that we as Western musicians tend to be the most familiar with. Um, all of that varies a lot person by person, culture by culture, all of those awesome things. There's a lot that we are not touching on about the cultural uses of all of these scales. And like we were saying earlier, there are a billion other scales that we are also not touching on today. So there is, it's a big wide world out there, but this is sort of an intro to scales, keys, modes from kind of a Western perspective. So JC, is there anything that you want to say about all of these modes and everything like that before we move on? Yeah, just, just briefly, I think one of the, I already closed the window or else I'd show you, but one of Go my ahead. favorite things about how the way modes work is like you were saying before, it's the same scale, the same notes, the same triads. It's just everything is shifted. Every time you change modes, you just, it's like, I don't know, pardon the bluntness of this analogy. It's its a mode selector dial on like a microwave or a toaster oven or something. You're just, okay, you're grilling, you want to air fry, click, you're in a different mode. Oh, you want to go to the next mode? You want to go to, you want to go to Dorian? Okay, click, bang, just shift the whole thing over. And it's the exact same stuff. You don't have to worry about accidentals or anything. You're just literally shifting to the next thing. And I think that's a really, really easy and fun way to keep track of how these different things work. You don't have to worry about, oh, is this note flat? Is this note sharp? Nope. Same notes. You're just starting in a different spot and you're going to get back to the same spot. Well, the same different spot, if that makes any sense. But I think that's a, yeah. a really, really fun, easy way to make sure that you uh, understand how all of that stuff works. But like Dana said, there's infinite applications of this that we just simply don't have the time to get into. I heavily, heavily encourage you to go to any of the people on YouTube that make the wonderful explainer videos on it. I think some people have yeah, mentioned someone in the here chat. just yeah. said that Charles Cornell does a video on that, uh, mm -hmm. which, yeah, I'm sure. So exactly. There's just like JC saying, we are scratching the surface here, right? These are, you know, scales are, of course, used worldwide. And there's only so much of that that we can condense into this one episode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I think that that is probably what we have to say about our main topic today of skills, keys, and modes. Um, and of course, if anybody has any questions about this, you can always um, reach out to JC and myself on the Play Discord. We're here pretty frequently, and we are here to help. We are here to answer questions. We're here to do all of that stuff. We love talking about music. We could go on and on. Please ask us questions. <laughs> <laughs> but with that, I think that we're going to go ahead and we're going to move into our next segment where we're going to talk about an arrangement that is new to the Play platform this week. So JC, he's just taking his time to get it all set up and everything mm -hmm. like that. And we'll go into that next. Yeah, so I'll let, uh, I'll let Dana take the lead on this because this is her arrangement. But if you go over to the little live stream thing again, You'll notice that this is City of Stars by Justin Hurwitz is something that Dana just put up. And we actually have plays that you guys have made. And uh, you might notice a familiar face. And uh, we'll just say... Uh, You're familiar with our episodes. <laughs> we'll, we'll just say, you, you might know these first six guys right here. You might be familiar with them. <laughs> you might have seen them once or twice. <laughs> and then... Uh, you might be familiar. <laughs> and then you might know this guy too. Just, just maybe you might have seen him. But uh, Dana, yeah. <laughs> why, don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what this arrangement is and why you wanted to make it? Yeah, so 
This was the winning arrangement of our song poll of the week. JC and I put up song polls every single week for music that will be added to the Play platform. And if you've just stumbled across this YouTube video and you're not familiar with what Play is, it is basically like musicians karaoke. You log on and you are you have a whole database essentially of sheet music in front of you from all different kinds of styles and genres and you can select which instruments you play, you select which parts you want to do, and you make videos of them which look just like this. And as you can see, there's tons and tons of different buttons there for the different parts that are in this song. Um, and so you can select them, you fill in the parts that you want to, other people fill in the parts that they want to, and then you get a product that is just like this. So let's go ahead and we'll hear this first and then we'll start to get into um, the nitty gritty of what's going on here. All right, so let's go ahead and play it. I love that so much, especially exactly. especially the percussion. That's wonderful. <laughs> Glorious. <laughs> yeah, as you can see, or as you might be able to see, um, there was no percussion part originally written for this. That's the beauty and the magic of play. You can log on, and even if a part is not specifically outlined there, you are always, uh, you are able to, and in fact, you are encouraged to add things that aren't originally there to sort of give everything your own creative spin, your own creative twist. We take these parts as suggestions instead of um, <laughs> as, you know, must do, must blah, blah, blah. Creativity is encouraged. Uh, so this arrangement is, <laughs> this is fantastic. Sylvain's falsetto is outstanding. Um, I don't know why he's wearing the helmet, but <laughs> I love it nonetheless. I think that it's very, um, it adds to the, <laughs> to the feel of this play. So as you can hear, this is, um, this is a duet. It is a vocal duet, and it's also a duet between the second violin part and the cello, which are covering the same parts as the voices are doing. And I think you could hear it pretty well. This is a pretty straightforward arrangement. I didn't have to modify very much from the original, uh, which sometimes we very much have to do. Um, but this one was a pretty easy one-to-one. -one. The most challenging part was distributing the piano parts, um, which the first violin and the viola are taking. They're taking the higher harmonies. Um, ironic, but you know, <laughs> and the bass is doing um, kind of the running, you know, the bass line, obviously. Um, which is sort of an ostinato throughout. It doesn't change a ton. The rhythm is pretty much always the same. But this one is a pretty straightforward arrangement. I don't have a whole ton to say about it because, you know, it's pretty much a one-to-one -one of the first however long it is. Oh, hey, look, um, I'm in the corner. Half. <laughs> ah, double no, JC. I, yeah, I'm just going to show you guys the music while she's uh, explaining the rest of this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So it's pretty much a one-to-one -one of the first. Uh, like I said, I don't remember exactly how long this is. Um, minute to minute and a half um, of the actual song from La La Land. It was pretty simple to do. The most difficult thing was hearing the piano chords, but otherwise this was a very, very faithful arrangement, as we kind of like to say, um, very true to the original. And it was a ton of fun. It was really awesome. I love the, 
uh, I don't know why I'm saying this word so much, but I think that it's applicable the flavor of this one. Um, I think that it's very fun. I don't do a ton, a ton of, you know, jazz inspired stuff. So it's a treat when I get to do something like this. It's a ton of fun. And that's pretty much what I have to say about it. Now, even though you could see that all of the parts are covered in this song, just like Ariana is saying in chat over here, you can always, and in fact, you are encouraged to add more parts, even if they are all fully covered. That's another thing that is so fun about play. You never have to be faithful to the parts that are there. You can always add more stuff. And if a part is already covered, that doesn't matter. It only makes it more fun if more people join in. And we love that. It's all about being collaborative and playing with other people after all. And we think that that is, that's what the spirit of play is. And it's awesome and we love it. So that is our arrangement for today. Now we're going to take it to our next segment here in, nope, in just a moment. I clicked the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take it to our next segment where we talk about the new updates that are coming to play. You hear them here before anywhere else. So if you are watching this back on YouTube at a later date, this is the place to be if you want up to date news on everything that is going on with play. We are adding new tech advancements and upgrades every single week. And this one is especially exciting. JC, would you like to would you like to tell everybody about our newest update to play? Or should I go ahead and do that? What do you want? Well, I can go ahead and talk a little bit about it. So we are going to be introducing a new thing called the daily play pretty soon, possibly even as soon as tomorrow. Huh? Exciting, exciting. So what this is, is we're going to take one or two bars of iconic motifs that a lot of people might be familiar with from different things like film or games or popular music, classical music, whatever. And we're going to be putting those up on the platform every single day. And then what you can do as a play member is you can go in and you can record those or you can add on to other people's and you can enjoy seeing different people's interpretations and different performances of stuff. And I think that's really fun. It's a great way to get introduced to maybe something you haven't seen before or something you're not familiar with and also get to see different people on the platform you might not have seen play anything. And that's all sorts of fun. I am really looking forward to see what what comes up first and who is going to submit what and get to know some new people and some new music through it. Dana, do you have any thoughts on that? That's pretty much what I was going to say. I'm also <laughs> super excited about it. Um, and I think that this is also a fantastic way if you're not incredibly familiar with the platform, maybe you're a little bit, maybe who knows, maybe you're intimidated by it, recording a whole longer video, even though they're not that long, but a longer video might feel like a lot of work or a lot of pressure, which we fully understand. And that is why we wanted to implement something like this, where you literally just log on and you play two or three measures of a super iconic motif that, you know, everybody knows, which doesn't mean that everybody knows it, it just means that it's a, a common popular one, you know. Um, but we're very excited about it. I can't wait to see what comes out of it. And I'm super excited to see people being creative with this. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So with that, I believe that that's all of our, um, all of our updates for the day. Um, Floor, if you're there, if there are any more, any other updates that you would like to give, uh, obviously you're more than welcome to do that and we'd love to hear them. Uh, but if not, I think that that's also, you know, incredibly exciting and we can't wait for the new daily play. So if you're there, feel free to unmute. I'm definitely there, but uh, I think you guys have covered the uh, the main thing that's going to be coming up. So the daily play uh, is super exciting and myself, I just can't wait to, to play. It's going to be fun. Especially like Dana was saying with the whole, I guess people might have a little bit of anxiety about diving in for the first time and only having, oh, okay, well, I have to play a whole minute of something. Well, I'm, I might not think I'm very good at my instrument, or I might not be confident that I have the ability to do something like that on camera, but Hey, it's a couple bars. It's, or it's, it's the motif from Beethoven's nine, or it's the lick that everybody knows. Like, Hey, everybody knows that. And you're not going to get judged because everybody knows it. And everybody is ready and willing to see you put yourself out there in a really low stress, easy way. And I think that's great. I can't wait to see it. Sorry about that. There was an alarm going off oh, in the no. room and I wanted to grab that and deal with it. My apologies. 
Ooh, didn't realize that that was in here. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and we'll take it to our next segment. I'm going to take some deep breaths to get prepared. This is our segment, Five Minute Facts, where I attempt attempt to give you <laughs> um, a relatively comprehensive history of a composer, musical movement, or otherwise interesting bit of musical history within five minutes. It's only been composers so far. So if anybody has any suggestions for non-composer entertaining things, um, musical movements, mm. musical instruments, um, maybe notable concerts, stuff like that, uh, we would also love to hear that. We'd love to get suggestions from the community about what you guys want to hear about. But today, we are going to be doing, I'm just taking some deep breaths, we're going to be doing Hector Berlioz, who is a wild person. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get a five minute timer started here. I'm not sure how confident I'm feeling. I think I could do this within five minutes. You could do it. I think I can. I've only lost once and I think that <laughs> was the first one on Sati. So I think if I speak fast enough, we could do this. Okay, three, two, one. Hector Berlioz was born in 1803 and passed away in 1869, and he was a French romantic composer and conductor. He was supposed to follow in his father's footsteps and be a doctor, but Parisian medical school required frequent examination of dead bodies, which he found absolutely horrible. His dislike of medical school was lessened by his father giving him a massive allowance, doctors, that allowed him to live a luxurious lifestyle, attending operas and concerts frequently. Berlioz's first contribution to the musical press was a letter he wrote to a music journal where he blatantly criticized Italian opera and claimed that it was vastly inferior to French opera. A very controversial take. He claimed that every opera of Rossini combined was outshined by even a few bars of one of Christophe Villebald Gluck's French operas. Uh, Gluck is German, but he wrote operas in French. So I still think that counts as German opera, frankly, but it's a debate for another time. Uh, after finishing medical school, Berlioz decided not to pursue medicine. His father then wanted him to study law, but they got into many arguments as Berlioz wanted to study music. His father tried to dissuade him by withholding his allowance, which ultimately failed. Berlioz entered the Paris Conservatoire in 1826, selector French pronunciation, anyway, and soon made the first of his four attempts to win the Prix de Rome, a prestigious composer's competition. He ultimately entered the competition four times, winning only once due to his dislike of composing in popular styles. Uh, he also developed a passion for Shakespeare's plays, despite the fact that he barely understood English. And while attending these plays, he developed a completely one-sided obsession with British actress Harriet Smithson. She refused to meet him. Berlioz wrote in his memoir about composing during the July Revolution of 1930. He said that he dashed off the final pages of his orchestral score to the sound of stray bullets coming over the roofs and pattering on the wall outside of my window. This composition was the cantata <clears throat> La mort du Sardanapal, pardon me, which finally won him the Prix de Rome. Uh, his previous entry was disliked by the judges and conservative mu musicians due to the fact that it betrayed dangerous tendencies. In 1830, at age 27, Berlioz became engaged to 19-year-old, how old was he? 1830, 1803, uh, 27, 19, huh, uh, Marie, Marie Mouk, a pianist. The same year, his most famous work, Symphonie Fantastique, was premiered. The audience included Franz Liszt, who later transcribed the entire work for piano so more people could hear it, which is also a very popular arrangement. Shortly after, he found out that Marie had broken off their engagement in favor of another suitor, and he hatched an absolutely insane plot to travel to Nice to her new fiance's home and get a job as a servant. He acquired various poisons, guns, and disguises with a plan to kill Marie, her fiance, and her mother, who for some reason he exclusively refers to as l'hippopotam, uh, the, 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 hippotam the hippotamus. Yeah, sorry, I glitched there. Hippopotamus, that's why I glitched. I was like, I'm missing a syllable. This is going very fast. Jeez. Berlioz studied in Rome for a short time, but returned to Paris in 1832 as he hated living in Italy. He presented a concert of many of his revised works, which was attended by many famous musicians and composers, including Chopin and Victor Hugo. He found a way to invite Harriet Smithson, and the two of them finally met. Against all odds, and sadly for Smithson, the two of them married in 1833. Smithson wanted to continue her career, but never learned French, which limited her career severely. Berlioz later cheated on her and married another woman. 
Paganini once, fun fact aside, Paganini once approached Berlioz to write a virtuosic work in which Paganini could play the Stradivarius viola that he recently bought. Upon receiving the finished work, Paganini complained that there wasn't enough for him to do and that he should be playing all the time. Oh, Paganini. Huh. Berlioz supplemented his income by writing as a music critic. He complained frequently in his articles about how much he disliked that. <laughs> the irony. Berlioz's later life was characterized by massive international success and a bizarrely tragic life. For some reason, people around him kept dying suddenly, including both Smithson and Berlioz's second wife. Even later romantic interludes seemed to end the other person suddenly dying, often without Berlioz's knowledge until he would happen to run across their grave. I don't know. Berlioz's life was characterized by aggressive obsession, both in his personal and professional lives. He frequently spent far too many years trying to have specific works premiered, even if musicians didn't want to perform them, and his personal life was bizarre, as shown by his obsession with Smithson and his bizarre murder plot. 19 seconds left. So that wow. is a short history of Berlioz, who composed one of the most well-known works of classical music in Symphony Fantastique, but was also just a just a real wild just a real wild kind of guy so that is five minute facts for the day i hope you learned something and as usual <laughs> if you found this interesting i welcome you and encourage you to go and research this on your own after this episode because these are you know you could only fit so much into five minutes no matter how fast you talk so consider these more of a gateway an entry to all of these composers and all of these topics that we discuss here that you can then later research and peruse at your leisure. So it's time for our last segment of the day. It's time for the blind test. I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to you, JC. Do you want to give us the rules and tell us what our prize is? Yes. So uh, I think most of you who are in here are familiar with the blind test, but in case you're not, the blind test is what we do every week at the end of Playground, where we have five different plays that people have contributed to the website and we'll play them for you with the title and composer redacted. And then whoever can guess the title first will receive a point. Whoever has the most points at the end of the game will be the winner. And the winner gets to decide on a song that will go up on the play platform, whether that means they arrange something or they have one of us arrange it or Juan, who is the resident composer extraordinaire on the Jelly Note staff, arrange it. Uh, whatever whatever you're feeling, you can talk to us and we'll figure out a way to get it up there. And that's the fun part. I know last week we had uh, Jacob was the winner who's uh, here with us today and his will be going up soon as well. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got the five blind test videos that I have captured from the play website in all their glory. And you can see everyone performing and who performed what part. And we will go right ahead and get started again. Please feel free to unmute or say in the text chat, we'll m be monitoring both of what you think the title is. And then we're going to listen to these in their entirety so we can appreciate the performances and we'll recognize the performers and we'll move on to the next one. Sound good. Here we go. Lonely boy. Well, that's right. <laughs> I like the brass arrangement. <laughs> I'm sure JC does too. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't write this one, but it's a good arrangement nonetheless. Nice. So much like I think it's pretty interesting how a composer who's not a brass player does really well. I know that's what the chords are kind of reminiscent of, right? <laughs> Very nice. Again, that's Lonely Boy by Paul Anka, which is performed by Timsa 8 or the uh, Orange Traffic Cone. Good thing I have the uh, the notepad window open. Yeah, uh, or Jacob, as you might know him, if you watched last week's episode where he told us about his fantastic musical adventures. So that's a great performance. That's a fun one that's up on play. It just recently went up. So if you want to perform alongside Jacob or make your own, feel free. It's available for you. We're going to go ahead and move on to number two now. Thank you. 
Is it stream? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's surprising considering it's made out of plastic and I paid fifty dollars for it, but <laughs> it, it, it does pretty well. Like a, it still sounds like a uh, uh, like a thousand dollar trumpet. Yeah, well, so, sometimes, sometimes you can still make good sounds with bad instruments, but. Yeah, quote unquote. <laughs> I was thinking of well, a, a plastic clarinet or something cheap on his own. I don't know. The musician matters much more than the instrument, right? Oh, thank yes. you. That's what I keep saying as an excuse to not getting a an expensive instrument. <laughs> Purple parts are still not um, covered yet. Correct. And that's Sid's theme by Nobu Uematsu, I think is how you pronounce that. I'm My Japanese is not very good. I'm sorry if that's incorrect. But that was actually arranged by a play member, Floop, who was playing the phoneme and the French horn parts in that one. And then... I played trombone and uh, trumpet, which neither of which I am terribly good at. And then we had also tar on flute. And there's also uh, clarinet parts that can be covered. So if you want to play those, doesn't have to be on a clarinet, or you want to play any other parts, feel free to join in on that. And that is a really are they fun no, Are there no tuba parts? Uh, there might also be a tuba part, but when I screen recorded this, I hadn't scrolled down to see it, so it might still be there. I, I'd have to. Uh, I'd have to. I'm look sure and tell it did. If there was originally, it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> there, there probably is one. But all right, let's go ahead and move on to number three. Be our guest. Yep. Um, I think someone doubled the voice part on another instrument. Mm -hmm. Oh, on is that euphonium? Or yep, that yeah. that's euphonium. I mean, you could. I mean, you could do that if you don't know how to sing. You could just play that part on your instrument. That's awesome. Yeah, that's what I do a lot. If there's a part that I want to cover in a song, but there's no string part, I'm like, all right, vocal line, let's go. We don't, we don't have to be singing. Yep, and that's exactly correct. Be Our Guest by Alan Menken from Beauty and the Beast. And Juan, who did this arrangement, is playing all the clarinet parts. And then Ryan, formerly known as at the Not Cool Ryan, who I guess just changed his play username to Ryan Piggy, which is a fun play on his actual last name, playing the vocal part on Euphonium, which is a fantastic instrument to cover vocal music with because it sounds like a male singing voice. I have done many of those. As well past. as cello does. Yes. Right? Cello and euphonium are wonderful uh, complementary instruments, and that's actually one of my Discord rules. First, cello phonium. A little bit of a uh, little bit of play Discord lore for you. Speaking of doubling parts, um, you should have seen my latest role that Floor added. I'll have to go oh, check that's that right. out. I think I saw that this morning. What was it again? It's the. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's the um, uh, harp board. Like I played a couple harp parts on keyboard okay. a few times. Nice. That's fun. Very versatile. Let's hit up number four. Born under a bad sign. Yep. Damn, I was gonna say it. <laughs> you were. You weren't fast enough. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's because I didn't grow up listening to this. I mean, my dad's oh, there you old, go. My dad's an old school 70s R&B fan anyway. And yeah, excuses. <laughs> and he loves listening to this type of music. And I think it's a pretty nice cover mm -hmm. on the play platform. Me too. Whoever's playing that lead guitar part is so good. Thank you. <laughs> it's interesting how we don't get to see Floor playing guitar often a few times. I mean, she's good that's at it. That's why I picked this one. Anyway, that's Born Under a Bad Sign by Cream with uh, 
Oh, my video disappeared. But that is uh, Leandro, the wonderful, wonderful bassist you might have seen here on Play Before, playing the bass part, Flora playing guitar, and then Jacob playing everything else, and then also bass again because of uh, panning. I guess uh, Leandro's part was panned one way, so Jacob decided, I'm going to pan it the other way. So I, I do that all the time That's when I when I record. Do. Yeah, because That's my, my interface do. only does uh, one like one side at a time. It's fun. Good I, get, uh, I get two for the price of four, I guess, when I go to record my... Uh, <laughs> The, the, deal. <laughs> the old negative 100% discount. I'm bad at math. I took a music major math. It's fine. But that's a fun one. That was actually requested by, I believe, Edward Kennedy, one of the very, very first people that joined the play platform as a keyboardist and a bass guitar player. So he, he'd been wanting that one for a long time. And we put that up there. Yeah, that was requested and a long time yeah, ago. There's a, I think there's a couple of videos of him doing it as well on the platform. But this is the one that I wanted to uh, show today. So we have one more. We're all tied up. We have Jacob and Ariana both have two. So <laughs> this next one contains neither of them. So you're not going to oh! know. You're not going to know exactly who this is because How neither rare? of you are in How there. How uncommon. It's almost like Already. I planned this. Maybe I stand a chance. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's see if Flor can get on the board here. All right. Number five. Um, my heart will go on. Yeah. Was I was close. faster. Latency. <laughs> Latency. I said it like two seconds sooner. Latency <laughs> cost me this point. <laughs> this song is so beautiful. I, I love it. Played it a few times. I swear, to Lord, if I uh, if I lose this point to the latency, <laughs> I'm giving it to you. I'm gonna give it to you. Thank you. Yes. Maybe, maybe it's because maybe it's because he wasn't um using the fingerings correctly because you know that probably the can it was it was it was on purpose. Correctly. That video was a can... meme. It was it was yeah, deli it deliberately was... something. But yeah, that's my heart will go so on good. by James Horner, performed by uh, if I mispronounce this, I'm sorry, uh, Nikki Yagme on viola, which is a wonderfully underrepresented instrument that I wanted to uh, showcase here with this one. But yeah, that's a, a really fun piece. It's been memed to the end of the earth and back like the I, I believe the video is called a uh, recorder by candlelight Titanic whatever Matt Mulholland uh, it's 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 been on YouTube forever it's hysterical it's funny he gets in costume he yeah. does these poses and stuff it's 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 a riot go watch it but that's that's a fun piece he, and that's on the platform as well a really good singer too mm -hmm. oh nice you wouldn't know it from that video but so Dana what's our official results our official results or Ariana with two, and Jacob with three. Jacob, you take Congrats, it again this week. Jacob. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so that is, uh, that's is—that's the end of the blind test. Uh, again, we do this every week. It's a whole lot of fun. You never know what's going to come up next week, so make sure you go and watch the videos on the platform because that's what we pull them from. Usually the featured tab or one of the more recent plays that someone's put up is what's going to be in the blind test. So if you're going on there and you're interacting and you're watching and you're leaving comments and stuff, you're probably going to be familiar with these things that we, uh, we feature in this section, and you might win. So that's just no, another instead of to go check the these out. What's the prize for the blind test? So the prize for the blind test again is you get to pick an arrangement to go up on the platform that our uh, arrangement staff, either myself, Dana, or Juan, will go in and you did create already for say you. That. Yes. Well, funnily just to enough, reiterate. that last one that we did, the Titanic one, is in fact 
an old request of Ariana's for winning the blind test previously. So there you really? go. If you want to see exactly, we just haven't announced it yet, as I just realized as we were watching that. So <laughs> I'm going to get on that. But if you have a song that you are absolutely burning to play, this is the easiest way that you can get it on the platform. By winning the blind test, that is the number one way that your request can get directly uploaded to play. Otherwise, it has to go through our song poll process um, and that, you know, it's not guaranteed that it will win. So this is the way to do it. But I believe that that is the end of our episode. And we have a couple of things to plug today. We have a couple of very fun things that are currently going on on the play platform and on our discord server so first off as we've kind of hinted at here and there our next monthly composition masterclass is coming up it's going to be the actual masterclass is going to be held on the first friday in october which is the seventh mm -hmm. <laughs> so that is when our next um composition masterclass is going to be held and our previous one was actually just recently posted to the Jelly No YouTube channel. I believe that it's the most recent long form video on there right now. That one took us quite a while to edit, mm -hmm. but we have um, We've improved made the process. process a million times <laughs> easier. So and everyone what, what, say thank you, JC, because he did all of that. And now he doesn't have to do that work anymore. Thank God. <laughs> um, but anyway, so that our previous one is up right now. And we have another one coming up, as we said, on October 7th, the deadline for, um, not for applications, the deadline for submissions is going to be on Friday, September 30th. So you have a little bit under a week if you have anything that you're sitting on that you really want to get some advice on. These could be completely finished arrangements or compositions. They could be ones that you're, you know, just in the beginning phases of or anything in between. We accept all levels, all kinds of music, all kinds of everything. We'd love to hear your stuff. So if you are interested in being a part of this masterclass, the information is here on our Discord server. That is where you can learn about that. And we also have an incredibly exciting new event that we are hosting here. JC, do you want to tell us about the Play Awards? Yeah, so... It's going to be really fun. We've been thinking about doing something like this for a long time. Let me actually months, go ahead and, months and let, months. let me pull up this uh, thing just so I make sure I don't miss anything. But Take your the time. Uh, hold on, I got to I got to move my uh, my Discord window here. This is the fun of doing this live. The uh, okay, so the Play Awards are a way for us to kind of see just how creative everyone in the community can be. So for this specific one, we want to see what the most crazy instrument that you can think of is and what the most creative way you can record a play is. So uh, JC, um, what is the mm -hmm. formal title of this event? The formal title of this event. Hold on. Let me scroll down so I can make sure I don't do it incorrectly here. Oh man, this, this is, this is, this is, this is a, this is a big one. All right. To quote Dana in the announcement post, for the very first edition of the Play Awards, we are proud to present dot, 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 the Play Awards for weirdest or most creative use of an instrument while still sounding like music. That's the official title of the event. But basically what that means is we, we just like yeah, <laughs> we, we want to see you get weird in appropriate ways <laughs> with your recording plays. So like what's the craziest sound you can get out of an instrument that you might not normally make or what's the most obscure instrument that nobody's ever heard of that you think would be really fun to showcase or what's like i don't know like the weirdest sound you can get out of something that's not an instrument or get creative with environmental sounds to make music with and it's there's the possibilities are endless we want to see your creativity and we want to see just how crazy you guys can be with this stuff so here's how this works is the event runs from now until october 1st and voting for the audience prize there's going to be different prizes we'll get to in a second voting for the audience prize is going to go for uh, October 1st through October 7th. And the winners will all be announced by myself and Dana on Playground on October 8th. So there's an incentive for you to be there. All you have to do to participate is visit the Discord, view the rules and submission info there. And then all you have to do is submit a link to a play that you've recorded on the Play platform to that channel. We'll catalog it and we will then go and review submissions. Jelly Note staff are going to pick the first two prizes. And then the audience, that's you, the Play members and the people in the Discord who will vote on the audience favorite. Uh, you can do three submissions per person and then we will pick the best among those. Now, what are the prizes? 
We got some oh, good stuff. I'm glad you asked. What are the prizes? <laughs> We've got some good stuff for you guys. We have three different prizes. Like we said, the first two chosen by Jelly Note staff and the third by the audience. The first prize is a Blue Yeti microphone. And you get to request a song for play. And you get a Play Ch Awards Champion Discord role. So if you're someone who's been really wanting to get a new microphone to record plays with, or you're looking for something that's a little more portable, then maybe you have some sort of crazy setup, then hey, this will be a perfect prize for you. So if you want to get a microphone, you can go ahead and submit, and the uh, first prize will go to that. Second prize is going to be the School Candy Hesh Evo headphones. Really nice set of headphones for uh, your listening pleasure, and as well as the requesting a song for play and the Play Award Champion Discord role. So that'll be the second place prize. The audience prize that everybody gets to vote on is your play will get a video edit by the fabulous Morgan of the play staff. And you've seen her things that have gone up on the YouTube channel, like the Stranger Things play, the Doctor Who play. Those have had some fantastic custom animations and, that, and really uh, great editing work. We also work. just posted her edit of uh, the Irish Washerwoman yes. in YouTube shorts. So that is also, uh, you can view that there. I don't remember, I watched it, but I don't remember how many animations there actually are there. There's a lot. So even though I watched it, so maybe scrap that. The other ones are very good indicators of her <laughs> skill and I might be forgetting. JC, back to you. Yeah, so uh, that's the audience prize. And uh, again, that's the one that everybody votes on. And it's going to be a whole lot of fun to see all these submissions come in and see how creative everyone can be. And I am very, very excited. We've already, we announced this earlier this week in this Discord, which is why you should be in there, because then you get this stuff when it comes out. Link's in the description. But it's going to be so much fun because the ones that we've already had submitted are really, really cool. We might include those <laughs> in future blind tasks. We might include yeah. some of them next week. They are fantastic. There's some truly, truly creative and insane things that people have already submitted. And I've heard from some other people what they're planning to put in. And you guys I aren't you guys that. aren't ready for some of these things if they're able to make that happen. It's going to be nuts. But again, that's what we're all about. We're, we want to have fun making music and enjoy the community that we've created with everybody. And what better way to do that than just have everybody act a fool and have some fun playing music that is uh, just kind of off the wall and creative in a really fun way. But that's the uh, the play awards. It, it's going to be awesome. You should definitely participate. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. And we would love to have you there. Danny, do you have anything else to say about these? No, I, you did a very comprehensive job. I am just so excited. Like we were saying um, at the top of this announcement, JC and I have been sitting on this idea for months, Long time. I think. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, I don't even know why we decided to implement it now because we've had this idea for such a long time, but I am so happy that we did. It has, there have been, you know, just a few submissions so far and they have already turned out miles better than I ever anticipated. Some amazing so stuff. I cannot wait. Uh, if you have so some you're... creative ideas, that's the place to do it. If you want to see some wild videos, that is the place to be. But I think that that is all that we have to say today about the Play Awards. And that is also the end of our episode. So thank you so much to everybody who's watching live and to everybody who's watching back on YouTube later. Thank you for supporting our content. This is super meaningful to us. And your support is why we are able to host these shows and these events the way that we do and in a broader sense the way that we are able to you know host play in the way that we do so thank you so much for watching um if you have any like we were saying earlier if you have any questions about anything at all relating to our main topic the play awards the composition masterclass, anything in between you can always message me or jc at any time uh for me pretty much literally at any time i am up uh around the clock it doesn't make a lot of sense. Yes, uh, sleep. Thank you so much for watching, <laughs> JC. Anything you'd like to say to close us off? No, that's uh, that's all we got for today. Again, thanks so much for joining us. It's always fun. Hope to see you in the next one, and we will have a fantastic week of looking at all these new submissions for the for the play awards. Man, I'm so excited <laughs> for this. But yeah, we'll we'll catch you later. Have a great one.